Uh, my name is Richard Calderon. I'm with Catapult Systems. Um, I lead what's called our Modern Workplace Strategy Service. I actually started at Catapult uh, back in 2001 uh, and was with Catapult for about 13 years. And then in the 2014 timeframe, uh, found an opportunity to join Microsoft. I was at Microsoft as a Modern Workplace Specialist for about four years. So got a lot of uh, really um, kind of the inside scoop in terms of how the business runs for Microsoft and where their direction was going under the new leadership with Satya Nadella, who started right around the same time frame. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, found an opportunity to rejoin Catapult. And so again, have the privilege of being back here. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, wanted to start off by basically just uh, saying that I, I, kinda, I tr tend to treat every one of these engagements as a networking opportunity, and I hope you do too. So I'm going to ask for a short bit of interactivity right here, just if you're willing to do this. So if you have your mobile phone, what I ask you to do is go ahead and, assuming you have the LinkedIn app, if you don't have the LinkedIn app, um, highly recommend you install it. This works whether it's iPhone or Android. So I'm going to fire up the LinkedIn app. And you may or may not know how to do this, so I'm just going to go ahead and show you how to do it, because I love to show it to everyone who's willing. Um, so you fire up the LinkedIn app. And if you're in an event like this, there's a really easy way to just instantly network with everybody in the room. So there's a little icon down here, kind of at the lower bottom of the screen, just to the right of the home. It's the network uh, section of the app. And then when you go here, just right up in kind of the center middle, just underneath the search box, there's a button there that says Find Nearby. And when you click this, I'm going to ask at least one of you to please do this, if you would. Um, when, what starts happening is you start broadcasting out your connection information. Okay. So within a networking event like this, what should start happening is people just automatically start popping up on the screen. And you can very, very easily just start adding people. So I, again, for those of you that are willing to, I would love to connect with you. Please do click Add Me to the Network. Um, and then when I'm done with the presentation, I will happily accept your connection. And then that way we have a connection. So long gone are the days of having those business cards. And I trade mine with yours. And mine ends up in the trash can and that kind of thing. OK? Um, that's my favorite way of doing it. You do have to have this page open in order for the broadcasting to continue. So again, I'm going to change the page now, but I'll, I'll happily uh, come back to this again at the end of the presentation. The other favorite way that you can also connect one on one, by the way, with people. So again, maybe you're not in an event, but maybe you're meeting someone at a coffee shop or out on the street or what have you, is just inside that search box, there's a little icon just to the right inside that search box. And that's the My Code option. When you click on My Code, it does one thing. It, it automatically will fire up your camera. And the very first time you do this, it asks permission, obviously. Can the app use your camera? But what this does is you can either toggle back and forth from scan or to what's called My Code. And there's a QR code that is basically the connection directly to me on LinkedIn. So then what you do is I show you this, you do your scan, and we connect, or vice versa. Okay. So it's really easy to do that also with a one-to-one -one kind of networking opportunity. Um, great. So thanks for letting me show that with you. The other thing I wanted to show you, just because I am using an iPhone, it's at a show of hands, iPhone users in the room, okay? Android users, okay? This works just as well. Um, Microsoft has done a really outstanding job in investing in bringing their services to where people are. And as you guys know, um, if you're like me, you tend to kind of live on your phone a lot these days. It's kind of it's the first digital experience I have in the morning. And um, oftentimes, it's what I tend to look at before kind of shutting off the lights in the evening is something on my phone. Um, I'm going to show you, actually, that although I don't want to death by PowerPoint you as well, I do want to show you that I'm actually going to give an example of being able to do work really from anywhere, from any device. So in this case, I'm going to present to you from my phone. Okay? You would typically think, well, how in the world are you going to do that? Because don't you need PowerPoint? And well, as a matter of fact, PowerPoint is one of the apps that I have running here on my phone. Again, they're available for Android and iOS. So I'm going to fire up PowerPoint. And I've got my presentation here. And I'm going to put it in presentation mode and just sort of flip it over. And then there's the presentation. And I'm just going to go ahead and conduct it from here because I think this will make it nice and easy. So for any of you that are all inclined to be able to do that type of thing, deliver a presentation even to your own team from your phone, just know that that's possible to do. Okay. So I like to start with this because uh, I think this tends to resonate, is that you know, today's 2019 on the cusp of 2020, uh, our, our current digital experiences sometimes just feel this way, right? Why, I've heard it said, that is, why is it that in our home life, in our consumer life, it feels like we can have the Jetsons lifestyle, but then all of a sudden we go into work and it feels like we're back in the Flintstones again, okay? So unfortunately, that tends to be the case. 
And as you guys know, working in government agency, um, sometimes there's even a longer process that it takes to actually get the technology to be even close to uh, in parity with what you can experience in your day life. So there are expectations that we have just going in. And this crosses all generations, I would say. By and large, uh, my dad, who resisted even using an ATM machine for the longest time, you like go to the bank and go in and like ask for you know go up to the teller and ask to withdraw money. Um, eventually, this is a decade or more longer ago now. Now he'll go to an ATM. Um, my dad is also all about his iPhone now, right? So so cross generationally, I would say the expectations of your digital experiences from your home life into the workplace uh, certainly is along these lines. Where why can't we do things easier the way that we get to do them? Um, in our home life. So again, just kinda, I'm just going to show you because I think you guys are interested. So here's the presentation on my screen, and I'm using it kind of as my teleprompter, if you will. And I'm just going to swipe my thumb, and by sliding through here, this is me using full-blown PowerPoint presentation from my phone. Okay. So today's changing modern workplace. You know, Michael hit on some of these things. Uh, it's not so much that the world is changing; it's that the world has changed around technology, without question. And if you blink, it'll pass you by quickly. Um, so many considerations in terms of technology and how that applies to our modern environment, working environment. Um, number one, the fact that mobile, I'm kind of overstating the case now, but the fact that uh, so many more folks wanting to use their mobile device more and more, I actually tend to push this device to about as far as I possibly can until I'm to the point where like, okay, I really need to open up my laptop again. Um, I tend to test myself on that every so often. How far can I get? As a matter of fact, I was making an edit to this PowerPoint presentation on my phone, for that matter, about uh, 15 minutes ago, just to correct a spelling error I had. Um, but mobile and social, social uh, paradigms and social influences, whether you uh, are familiar with or you are a user of Facebook or Twitter or any of the ever-growing perpetual uh, number of social uh, apps and services that are out there today, that style of working is being brought into the workplace in terms of an expectation as to how work can get accomplished because it's very seamless and it's very interactive and very collaborative. 45% um, use of social tools at work as well as f a 400% increase within the past five years in terms of the number of mobile devices that uh, folks tend to want to use. Michael touched on that diverse generations. Um, first time ever in history, five generations of users in a workforce. Um, that is a difficult challenge to address to say the least in terms of getting those folks to actually be willing to interact with each other, much less face-to-face, -face, but in digital services as well. Um, plus the fact that more and more people would love to be able to have autonomy over their schedule and determine not only when, but where they get work done. Um, that's important to me. I actually have four small kids at home. Uh, it's just sort of the way the, the life sort of worked out. Um, it's great, but it's also super busy. <laughs> so all I have really right now is time for is home and kids and work, and that's it. Uh, long gone were days of having hobbies and other things. Hopefully I can pick back up again at that some point. But a huge part of how I manage to balance that life and have uh, some sense of sanity is because I do choose when I can simply work from my home office, um, when I can choose to go down the street to the coffee shop and meet with a colleague or even uh, offer to meet with a customer or come into an office space. Uh, that is very much empowered by the cloud and by mobile capabilities. Um, so 72% of workers working remotely by 2020, that's next year, okay? So there's lots that has changed. And then team-based collaboration, again, we've talked quite a bit about that earlier with Merit from TRS, um, that the ability to be able to work more collaboratively and the fact that we work on more teams than we ever have before. Um, sometimes they're long-standing teams, sometimes they're ad hoc teams that just need to spin up for six weeks and then they, they disband and, and you go on to other things. Having digital services and capabilities in order to be able to empower those teams is critical. Um, and with 80% of employee time uh, per survey saying that they spend focusing on collaboration. So different teams have different needs. Uh, we certainly have talked about that in terms of the generational workforce challenges and so forth. Um, but just looking at the simple fact that there's a number of different ways that, uh, I'm not, let me go back here now on this. This is a Wi-Fi connectivity thing that's slowing me down a little bit here. Um, siloed applications is one of the biggest challenges, just that moving from one experience to another tends to create friction. It also creates cognitive load, as I'm sure you've heard of this term before, which is having to context switch between one application to another. Um, multiple logins and so forth and difficulty finding information, huge challenges. Wasting time just sort of falls into that overall category. Uh, difficulty in finding information, knowledge, people, and so forth. And the IT challenges, specifically for the IT folks in the room, 
We all know that, uh, again, with the proliferation of consumer grade applications and services that allow for fairly collaborative and seamless information sharing, um, if you're not offering that or if the agency IT is not offering that to your users, they'll go find that somewhere else. Um, I tend to call that credit card IT because that's really what they're doing is they're going to a website and kind of entering a credit card and then all of a sudden they have Dropbox or Google Drive or any number of things that they're bringing into your organization which is a challenge for IT because it's a risk from a security perspective, uh, putting uh, agency data and public data obviously out on consumer grade services. So these are a number of different challenges that we're facing uh, today in the workplace. And then got a sneak peek at this slide, but Office 365, which is really my core area of expertise, uh, a continually growing tool set of communication and collaboration services that allow you to, in part, at least use the services that you're already familiar with, uh, that users have been using for maybe decades now, like Word and PowerPoint Excel, coupled with a number of additional really born in the cloud-based services that collectively those collections of services enable an incredible new way of working that really just wasn't possible to do before. And again, I'll share all these slides, we will share all these slides with you when we're done so you can have these for your reference. Um, so we talked uh, quite a bit about Microsoft Teams, and I want to focus just a little bit more here just in terms of what those core capabilities are. So again, Microsoft Teams really provides sort of three, four fundamental primary, uh, addresses three to four fundamental challenges um, within digital services. Number one is that pure ability to be able to communicate with others through an, an instant message or a chat-based environment. Um, the ability to be able to collaborate in Teams within um, uh, organized, connected workspaces that have intelligence and other services tied into them. The ability to use third-party applications as well as Microsoft first-party applications, again, all within sort of the single pane of glass, if you will. And then once again, for those IT folks, uh, sitting on the Microsoft platform, secure, compliant, enterprise-grade, uh, Microsoft heavily, heavily invests, invests in security and compliance annually to ensure that you don't have to be concerned about putting data out in the cloud because they're, they're managing the regulatory compliance as best as they can for you. Um, so again, just unpacking these a little bit here. Again, we talked quite a bit about this. We use Microsoft Teams uh, almost exclusively internally at Catapult. There are still some folks that we have to kind of nudge and encourage at times. They'll send an email internally just to kind of ask questions and so forth, and I'll try to redirect them as much as I can. But that ability to do private one-to-one -one or group chat through uh, Microsoft Teams is a huge uh, productivity enhancer for me, especially from a mobile device. Because think of it again as just like text messaging. So today I'm gonna kind of assume that most of you probably text message with one or more people, uh, maybe in your family or your friends. So the ability to use the Teams mobile app for that texting chat between myself and another colleague or a group of colleagues to stay connected on what's going on around work or a project, et cetera, uh, is invaluable to me. Um, so being able to, to utilize that is, is uh, a huge boon for the application. I also mentioned the integration with other Office 365 applications. So again, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, those are all baked into the service. Um, being able to co-author with files, um, co-author within Word documents and PowerPoint documents, et cetera. Using SharePoint, OneNote, Power BI, Planner. Again, some of these services may or may not be familiar to you, but just know that Microsoft Teams brings all those together into what they call a hub for teamwork. Um, this one, Eric touched on a little bit, and I know that Merritt touched on a little bit as well, but what I have certainly seen working with a number of customers, both in the public and the private sector, is that the ability to leverage the meetings capability in Microsoft Teams can really be transformative in terms of how you're able to collaborate and be more efficient in disseminating and sharing information. Um, no one has ever said, you know, I don't have enough meetings on my calendar, clearly. Uh, you typically have more than you should. So the, the ones that you do have, as effective as you can make them, that's to your benefit. So Microsoft Teams bringing the ability, for example, before a meeting to offer to you some insights about the people you're working with and the projects you're working with so that you can get up to speed with what's going on before actually attending the meeting. Then during the meeting, being able to leverage all the capabilities within the service to do video sharing, screen sharing, whiteboarding, chatting as an offline service or, or as a sidebar service, if you will, during the actual meeting to be able to keep everyone informed and stay engaged 
And then after the meeting, it was also mentioned earlier too about Microsoft Stream and how you can do recordings of Microsoft Teams videos that automatically get stored in the Office 365 service in what's called Microsoft Stream, um, which would have automatic transcribing of that content based off natural language processing so that you then have captions and what they call deep searching, which means you can then go and do a text-based search for information in that meeting because it was transcribed for you automatically, okay? So these are really powerful services in the cloud that really, again, can be transformative in terms of how you just meet. Questions? Uh, so part of Microsoft Teams ties into what's called Microsoft Stream. Stream is, uh, is think of it like the YouTube for your agency. It is basically a video content curation service. Again, it's built in straight to Office 365. I believe everyone in this room has access to it as part of the subscription you have for Office 365. And uh, again, it, it allows you to, in Teams, record a meeting, and then that video automatically gets stored inside of Microsoft Stream so that you have on-demand access to it. Okay, question. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. As a matter of fact, you can. Yeah, let's 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 chat a little more okay. deeply about that. But just suffice to say, uh, there's a separate component of Teams and Stream that's called Team Lives Event. Mm -hmm. Teams Live Events, rather, if you want to do a search on that, Teams Live Events allows for that more kind of even external to the agency webinar uh, functionality. Okay, it's more mm -hmm. kind of. Uh, produced content and you can have Q&A and things like that that are going on with that. Hey, okay, yeah. One thing, um, so I know a lot of you uh, are, well, I know some of you are with HHSC and Health Human Services was one of the very early adopters of Office 365, so you actually have a, a 365 commercial tenant versus a government tenant. Mm -hmm. And some of you are the government tenant, most of you are the government tenant. And so uh, there are some features that are available on the commercial side that are not yet available Right. So if you don't have something, then you can talk to your Microsoft account team, um, which you can go through your, your IT group um, to get to them and find out if it's not available, is it coming? There are some things that unfortunately exist due to some of the regulations that apply to the government cloud that they just essentially just can't be, can't be put into that cloud because of the, uh, the level of certification, security certification. So it, both clouds are equally secure. It's just there's some regulations Good, good call out, thank you. And Stream falls into that category where Stream just came to the government cloud enabled, I think sometime in the past couple of months, I wanna say. It wasn't there all the way up until very recently. Okay, okay uh, let's kind of move on a little bit here. So we've talked a little bit, we've talked actually extensively, I should say, about Microsoft Teams, but we know there are more things in Office 365. So again, I'm just giving you very broad brush strokes at this point, not trying to deep dive into any of these. Um, but just to, to start off with, I think most of you have probably heard the saying before, that email is where knowledge goes to die. If you've not, um, I feel very strongly about that. Um, you know, you and I, if we exchange an email, you ask me a question and I respond back to you, we may benefit individually from that interaction, but no one else does, really, okay? It just gets buried in email. And truth be told is I may not even benefit six months from now because I can't remember where I put it, okay? Trying to use the search function and go find it and so forth, so it's buried very deep in there. Um, I know it's here somewhere, but it's just wasting time for me trying to find it. So with that said, if you are, however, if, if email is the right use case for you, Office 365 uh, adds a number of additional capabilities in terms of sort of your Outlook email experience um, that makes for a more intelligent, productive, uh, focused ability. That is to say, focused inbox, which is this notion of being able to, the service over time learns things about what you do and who you interact with and how you behave around did I or did I not even open that email to read it? And over time, it starts to make suggestions, if you will, as to what it feels like is important to you and what's not. Now, this isn't junk mail, by the way, so don't think of it as like it's trying to figure out that this is all junk. You may think it's junk, but uh, it's really just trying to help you prioritize, focus in on the things that matter to you most. Focused Inbox is a, a, a service in Office 365 that doesn't come in on-premises. 
Um, and then the ability to be able to use uh, what they call cloud attachments through a service like OneDrive or SharePoint. So again, if anything, eliminate, once you're using this, eliminate that whole thing about attaching a document to an email and then sending it internally to 10 people to review. We all know the challenges that that has had for years. Um, email has just truly been utilized. It's been changed and morphed into something it really wasn't intended to be used for. And attaching files is one of them, okay? Even though we all know that that's what we're kind of used to doing, there are better ways. And so what are called cloud attachments um, is one of those types of things. And there's more here, obviously, but just kind of moving on. We talked a little bit about OneDrive inside of Teams, but using the ability to store your personal files, share them with others, synchronize them to your local device, and again, have access to them anywhere you, you really have access to the service. Again, I use OneDrive from my mobile device all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, in this case here, this PowerPoint presentation was, sure, was stored inside of a Microsoft team which actually is using SharePoint behind the scenes to store that file. And then I just pulled it up on my phone to be able to get access to it, okay? So that easy, seamless access to that kind of information um, is something that you can certainly do inside of OneDrive or SharePoint. Um, uh, speaking of, so modern content and discovery with SharePoint sites. So again, SharePoint in Office 365, those of you, a uh, show of hands, that are using SharePoint on-premises or have used SharePoint on-premises at some point in time, okay? And then sh keep your hands up if you love SharePoint on-premises. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right, fair. Uh, that's fair, okay? That was, uh, that was an unfair question, I should say. Um, we all either have had a love-hate relationship. I came from a SharePoint background, started with SharePoint back in 2004, so I had seen many, many, many changes and gone through many, many painful upgrades of SharePoint server on-premises over the years. Uh, so SharePoint in the cloud is not your grandfather's SharePoint anymore, okay? There are uh, not only countless number of stability improvements in terms of the cloud service, but additional enhancements and capabilities that really do allow for just a much more productive collaborative experience. Um, in addition to that, uh, Yammer, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, in the government cloud, Yammer is not actually part of the GCC specifically. In other words, the data is not stored in the government cloud. But if you have a, e, or excuse me, a G3 license, I believe, you have the entitlements to Yammer. That is to say, you have the rights to use Yammer. Um, your uh, administrators would just need to request the usage of that. But Yammer is basically the ability, pardon me? I believe, that, I believe they do have Yammer licensing as well. Yeah, G1s and 3s, I believe, have the Yammer license as well. Okay. Uh, I believe they have, I believe 1s have, yeah, Yammer. I want to say, it's pretty, I'll do, we'll double check on that for you, but I believe that the Yammer entitlements come into G1. Um, you could think of this sort of as your social network within the agency, again. The idea behind this is not necessarily just for it to be social for um, non-work related, although we've seen many organizations utilize this type of platform to connect people in ways that are more personal, maybe sort of non-work. You can think of like Mother's Day or Father's Day activities or the, you know, the uh, uh, donation giving drives and things of that nature, all that kind of stuff that you would like to be able to promote within so that everyone gets a sense of what's going on. Uh, Yammer is a great platform for being able to utilize that. Um, okay, so again, in the interest of time, just kind of pushing on. The last section I really wanted to focus on a little bit here was just to kind of give you a sense of, in my area, again, I lead a, a service called Modern Workplace Strategy. The strategy is that um, oftentimes, especially with something like Office 365, what tends to happen is it's looked at as like, oh, well, it's going to be used to replace email, or it's going to be used to put our files in the cloud and so forth. And while that is true, at least in part, there's so much more that it really can do to be more business transformative. Like again, like Merritt was referring to TRS, they call it the Digital Business Transformation Initiative, uh, the DBT, and Office 365 really can and should be thought of more as a business transformation opportunity as opposed to a deployment of technology. So I love this slide because uh, care of a Microsoft MVP, Matt Wade, uh, has this website that's called uh, jumpto365.com. So if you cared to, to go out and look at this, it's all interactive. Um, as you can see, he's trying to identify or relate this to a periodic table. There's just a lot of things and a lot of apps and a lot of services and a lot of tools in Office 365. So when do I use what and when do I deploy what and enable this and so forth? It can be confusing. So there's lots and lots of choices. What those choices lead to, unfortunately, is, is I think this is irrelevant if you're familiar or not familiar with this story. Uh, is around the six blind men and the elephant, is that the six blind men all walked up to an elephant 
And because they were each touching the various parts of the elephant, they were trying to describe to each other what they thought it was. So one blind person who's touching the trunk, for example, saying, oh, well, it's a snake. And the other blind person who's touching the tail says, no, 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 it's a rope. And another person's touching a different part, the ear, saying, no, it's a fan. And so to each one of them, that was their reality. They were like, this is what it is. And I'm, I don't care what, you, what you're saying, this is what it is, OK? Um, the idea behind this is that this is applicable when we think about our digital work environment and services like Office 365 is if we don't step back and look at it in a more holistic view, kind of what I refer to as the widescreen view of your technology services, then you can end up with any number of these challenges, overly complex, fragmented, inflexible, redundant information, inconsistent, and certainly the user feels the impact of that where there's poor usability in terms of these overall services. So please, please don't think of treating these types of initiatives like uh, siloed technology deployments. Really think about developing an overarching plan for that um, to avoid these types of problems. Um, just again, just to give you a sense of uh, sort of like what the overall strategy process is like, um, it all starts with having really a core understanding and sitting on the found foundation of what the mission of the agency is or your agency mandate. So we really want to always anchor on the why are we doing this to begin with. And then we clearly want to at least identify a vision. We understand where are we going with this. And it doesn't have to be a far-reaching vision per se. It could just be we're trying to optimize the way we do certain business processes today. Or if you're further along than that, if you're where TRS is, maybe your vision is much more in the future state um, where you're really, really trying to transform the organization. But it has to have a vision. And then clearly we want to understand where you are now, where do you want to go? And then the gap between those two things is basically the roadmap. Now, again, for any of you that have even remotely seen an IT roadmap in the past, you probably looked at that thing and just kind of went like, that's meaningless to me because I don't understand what they're talking about and there's bits and bytes and networking and all this kind of stuff. The roadmap that we would help develop here is nothing like that. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like here in just a minute. Um, some of the guiding principles for what they refer to as a digital workplace, and you can think of Office 365 as being a core set of capabilities in your agency's digital workplace, is that number one, it has to be focused on value. So we really have to identify what is it that's valuable to both the end user, so the what's in it for me, as well as what's valuable to the agency at large, so that you have at least those two things to be latched onto at any given point. User-centered is the thing that, again, often tends to get forgotten and overlooked, unfortunately. Um, oftentimes it's like, here's the tools we have and this is what you're going to get. And the user is really left out of the equation. Um, in our process, what we do is we focus on the user. We really want to get down, again, as Merritt was referring, those user stories, trying to understand what are your current challenges, what are the current opportunities around collaborating, communicating, and then aligning Office 365 services to that. Holistic, I mentioned, with that example of the elephant, really looking at it from end to end. And then iterative, co-creating and evidencing, uh, just more principles to align to the way that you would develop a strategy for your digital workplace. This is way an eye chart, so I'm not going to uh, read every single bit of this to you. But again, just kind of giving you a sample that there is a method to the madness um, going through the overall strategy definition to a roadmap and then into the planning and the implementation phases. Probably the most important thing to notice here is that clear communication needs to be happening throughout this process. And then both change management and project management, those disciplines are really critical to the overall success. Again, oftentimes these initiatives, pardon me? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, question? Oh, five minutes, okay, yeah, uh, thank you. So again, oftentimes uh, the project management discipline is the thing that we tend to equate to these types of initiatives, like, well, it's a project, we gotta get this deployed, and we gotta figure out how to get people trained and so forth as a project, but the discipline of change management is as critical as the project management here. And unless you have like an office of change management like TRS, uh, that's something oftentimes that there's a lack of, of the resources there, the skill set. Um, and then we're getting close to the end here, but just know that we at Catapult have over time developed and continued to evolve, and this is our current state of what we call our digital workplace capability framework. It is these 10 pillars of the types of things that we feel like are important to understand, assess, and then have some sort of a targeted future state within these various areas. The colored sections here are really, you can think of those mostly as capabilities by and large. So 
features and ways of working, whereas the couple of shades of gray here are really more sort of foundational at the business level, whether it be user experience or adoption and change management and so on and so forth. So we use this as sort of a framework and as a guide to sort of understand where you are today and then where do we go. So this applies directly to this roadmap example. So again, I know this is super hard to read. I will happily go through this with you in detail if you'd like uh, when, when you get this. But um, just know that you can see that here on the far left-hand side, this aligns to all of those various pillars in our capability framework. And then when you're looking at this example here was set aside uh, across four quarters, but it could be any duration. It could be two years, it could be shorter, whatever it may be. But as you'll see here, um, I'll read some of these to you that, that are probably hard to unpack a little bit here, but like under mobility and flexibility for this customer, they initially wanted to start off with this theme of working from anywhere. And that was really mostly focused around the mobile access, to be honest with you. Not quite so much about bringing my laptop home and that kind of thing, but they wanted to empower their users as quickly as possible with having a number of those mobile services available to them. So they started off with a pilot. They went then into Q2 into what they call the early adopter program with an eye on uh, leading into Q3 for the broader rollout, as well as modern teamwork under collaboration, uh, migrating content in the early stages for information management, and et cetera, et cetera. You can see here that under some of these other more of the business-focused areas, um, they started off taking our recommendations of what we refer to as building a digital workplace uh, working group and a steering group. And those, again, to kind of, kind of anchoring back to the first presentation, that's all about the people, right? Getting the right people involved and ensuring that they understand why this is important, defining a vision, and then even a governance plan, in this case for teams. Um, so this is the type of roadmap here that tends to resonate more with the business. When you show this to them, um, maybe this is even a little bit too deep for the most part, but at least it gives them a sense of understanding what are the types of things and ways of working that are gonna be coming down the pipe, um, as opposed to a deeply technical roadmap. And then as an example of kind of how do we get to this here, I wanted to show you, uh, this was something with permission that we had from another customer to share, is we go through a number of activities in a strategy development process, but this one I think is extremely relevant because on the far right-hand side, this column that's called strategic priorities, this was this particular business's current fiscal year strategic set of priorities. They had six of them around community and workforce and finances and innovation and so forth. So they shared those with us and we plotted those up here on the board. Then on the far left-hand side, you can see here, we started to identify a number of scenarios and capabilities in the digital workplace with Office 365 that they were interested in transforming about the business. Then what we did is we basically started to identify what were the business outcomes or the results of these new ways of working, and then based off of those results, what would be the benefit to the business or the overall value? Then as you can see lastly here is we made a pretty good attempt at being able to do some alignment with those benefits to those strategic priorities. So my goal and objective in this activity for everyone who participates in the room is to give you a way to be able to tell anyone who's asking you, like, what are you working on these days? Oh, well, we're working on the Office 365 thing. Okay, great, what does that matter? What does that mean? Well, I can tell you what that, what that, why that matters and what that means. It's directly aligning to and supporting in some way the strategic initiatives of the organization or the agency. Okay, so that's the type of activity that we would go through in this case here. Questions about that? Just, again, happy to share all this with you. And then lastly, just some thoughts, again, to leave you with, you know, some questions, again, from today's Modern Worker. Um, it's important to address these. It's important to be thinking about, you know, why should we be changing the way that we work? Why now? Uh, you've heard it before. What's in it for me? How do I gain these skills? And then I wanted to leave you with one thing that I thought, this is not my quote, but I think this is relevant today, is that we all know that change is the one thing that is constant, um, and we should be changing our mindset. Instead of being resistant to change, is we should be considering how to foster uh, resistance to stagnation, because sitting still is not going to help us continue to evolve, develop, and offer new services, uh, obviously, to the citizens of the state of Texas, our constituents. Um, staying stagnant is, and sitting still is the wrong place to be. So. Um, okay, happy to take questions at this point. I know I was probably up here at the end, um, or I know we're doing a panel discussion as well. So, but I appreciate it. Thank you very much for the time.